Okay, thank you. So this talk's going to be joined between myself and uh, Fujian Hazani. So what we're interested in is uh, simulations of phenomena. This is a uh, cutaway through a simulation of Hurricane Isabel. And what we're particularly interested in is how we go from volumetric data like this to rather messy looking abstract representations like this, but actually this is a, a 2D projection of a 3D graph. And if you look at the graph in, in three dimensions, it does actually tell you something interesting about the, the underlying phenomena, in this case, the hurricane simulation. So I'm gonna give you the, the sort of background story on uh, what we're doing in computational science and particularly in topological analysis, which is one of the subfields, and then wrap up with a, a summary of the joint quantum net uh, uh, representation algorithm, which uh, Fujian's then gonna come and tell you about how we've implemented this within a distributed functional setting in order to get uh, the kind of scalability that we're going to need going forward. And then, time permitting, I'll come back at the end and give you some of our conclusions about what we've learned from doing this and where we're hoping to go next. So just to put things in perspective, I mean, what, the area we work at computational science is about taking data that uh, comes either from uh, simulations on large machines up to supercomputer scale, the yield some kind of data set, and then you want to learn something about it. And uh, as Hamming's favorite, uh, famous quote says, um, the importance of computing isn't numbers, it's insight. So we want to be able to get insight either through doing some kind of analysis on data or, uh, as is very typical these days, by visualizing the data, converting it into an image. The characteristics of the data that we work with, well, we're typically interested in data that's volumetric, so it's defined over some 3D space. It's typically time varying, so we have a set of, of, of time slices. It, it may be higher dimensional, so it may not be 3D, it may be 10D or 20D or even 60D. Uh, and the data that we have is inherently multi, multivariate. So we have data that uh, at each point within some space, we're measuring some large number of properties. So just some examples of the kind of problems that we've worked on. Uh, last year at the FHPC, we talked about work on nuclear scission, which uh, on a relatively small data set of about 60 by 40 by 40 with two fields. Uh, this uh, simulation of star formation, we reported back in 2008, like slightly larger data set with 13 fields. Here we're talking about uh, the Isabel simulation starting to scale up now, but where we really want to be is, is where the uh, real supercomputer simulations are these days. SC14, for example, David Landry and colleagues reported on work on combustion that was on a 2025 20, by 1600 by 400 grid with a, a large number of, of attributes. And the value of this work is sort of nicely reflected by this front cover of Nature's. This, this was work that uh, Zhao and colleagues reported that. This was work that was done using uh, NAMD, a system which is uh, implemented uh, on top of the Charm++ architecture out of UIUC. Uh, they did a simulation of the chemical structure of the HIV capsid on, on this little beast here, the, the Blue Waters Cray. Um, 64 million atoms. Uh, several hours of compute time gets you profound insight into, into science. And the, the challenge that we have going forward, of course, is that the, the more uh, uh, good results that come out of doing computational science, the more the underlying scientists want in terms of scale and resolution and, uh, in order to be able to, to probe, uh, get even finer levels of result. So because we want to be able to scale up the, the question bit starts to get, how do you then carry out analysis of the data? If, if your data set starts off on a 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000 grid with a large number of time steps, um, you're looking at several gigabytes worth of output, even in the, in the best case. And if you look at the performance of the human visual system, you don't have enough time to eyeball that volume of data uh, in a couple years. So one of the trends that's emerged is taking uh, output data from simulation and trying to extract some kind of underlying representation that captures the important features within the data. So uh, topology started off by looking at a, a, a relatively simple problem. That's you've got a single scalar field defined over some m-dimensional input domain where you've got one, one sample measured against that field. So the idea is that we have some sort of sampling space, typically a regular grid like this, each point within the space, we've sampled some property, maybe temperature, maybe height, et cetera, and then we want to understand uh, what the structure of that space is. And the kinds of things that people are interested in within the scalar field are things like, well, where are the local minima within the field, where are the maxima, and, and where are the saddle points? 
So scalar topology gives you a vocabulary for talking about the structure of spaces and uh, work within the scientific computing and visualization communities ma ma from mathematicians as well has led to two kinds of, of abstraction that's now found, found uh, widespread use. One's the read graph, and what the read graph does is look at the structural contours. So if I take a, a scalar field and say, where did within the scalar field uh, is the field value at a particular constant value, maybe 6.5, then I get a contour line. In fact, in this case, I get two separate contour lines which are part of the same level set. And the, the abstraction that captures the, the nesting relationship of contours, the way that contours are nested within each other, is the thing called the contour tree over here. So the contour tree shows you where the uh, maxima, the minima, the saddle points are. And as you go from a saddle point, you can go, you may have choice of directions where you go up. It shows you where those particular contours uh, appear along those, those edges of, of the tree. So the tree, in a sense, is a compression of all the information that's in the original scalar field. Similarly, the more smell complex is an abstraction that captures information about gradients. So if you know the watershed algorithm for looking at uh, where within a field uh, flow occurs, so flow goes from, uh, from maxima down towards minima, what the more smell complex captures is the structure of how that uh, flow is divided into, into regions which are in 2D are diamonds, in, in 3D are uh, uh, octahedral crystals. So the, these kind of abstractions are, are, are used. So this is an example of an interface built using the contour tree uh, by our colleague Hamish Carr. Uh, what it's doing is it's providing you the ability to select individual contours within a, a 3D uh, volumetric data set. So within, within 3D, nesting of contours means that information is often occluded. The contour tree provides a way of exposing the nesting structure and allows you to select, in this case, important anatomical features within the underlying data. Uh, this was work uh, by Atele Galassi and colleagues. They're looking at a uh, simulation of what happens when different kinds of fluid mix together. I think this was kind of oil and water simulation. What you get is, is a very complex interface, and by using the more smell complex, they were able to break apart and understand the structure of that interface between the components. And then down here, yet another example, this is a simulation of vorticity within a combustion flue. Uh, if you look at uh, lambda 2, which is one of the properties of, of, uh, of flow, and try and construct an isosurface, you end up with a mess. But by using the contour tree, and then by doing simplification of the uh, structures by pruning bits of the tree which you know are in, uninteresting, you're able to expose the features that are actually significant in understanding the physical phenomena in the flow. Of course, uh, science rarely ever looks at a single property at a time. We're usually interested in what happens when you've got interaction between multiple properties. Now, if you're working in information visualization where the data isn't connected to some sort of physical space, then you've got a wide range of techniques available to visualize that information. So one of the very common ones you might have come across is parallel coordinates, where you lay out your coordinate axes in parallel, and then each sample point becomes a polyline, and then you, you can use, easily see the trends. In scientific data set, where the data is inherently pinned towards positions in space, we have a, a much harder problem, and the, the kind of techniques that we can then use are things like doing overlays. So this is from our 2008 paper at uh, ICFP on, using, uh, on looking at astrophysics, where we're taking uh, contours defined over separate fields, trying to superimpose those contours on top of a color map and work out where turbulence appears relative to a, a shock wave. Or over here, this is a, a standard visualization example from the, the VTK toolkit. You're visualizing uh, the flow of gas in a combustion chamber. The plates here are being uh, deformed by the vector field, which is defined by the flow, and then the, the plates themselves have been coloured by probing the temperature field. So you've got two kinds of information captured within the one display. That, that's fine. You can, you can cap build up visual representations, but then the question is, if you scale up your data and you need some kind of abstraction, how do you do something equivalent to topology? How do you combine topological abstractions? And the example, the idea that we've been working on now at Leeds for a couple of years is of thing called the joint contour net. It's a generalization of the idea of the contour tree, which captures nesting relationships of single scalar fields up to multiple fields. And what we're trying to do with that is to take some underlying domain that we've, uh, we've measured or simulated 
interested and then break that domain into larger regions of interest where we define a region of interest based on defining an equivalence relation over the, over the properties within there. So in this example here we've got uh, we've sampled a, uh, we've got a problem where we've got two different uh, fields uh, we've, at each node here we've got two sample values and what we're interested in is what the structure of those two fields as they interact might be. So what we do is we basically subdivide the domain into regions based on assigning an equivalence between values within the region, and then we construct a graph. Uh, where here, for example, this node in the graph corresponds to this region over here. It's all those parts of the domain where the combination of the first field lies in the value of 6 to 9, the second field also lies in the value of 6 to 9. There's no simple analogy of the minima and maxima and saddle points within the uh, contour tree, but it's still surprisingly useful. So uh, the work we reported last year, we looked at the analysis of data on nuclear fission. That led to uh, two papers in physical review. Since then, we've done work with colleagues at Leeds looking at uh, oceanography and using the joint contour net to identify regions of uh, ocean circulation, different kinds of flow. And what we're talking about here today is looking at hurricane simulation and looking at how the JCN can be used to extract features from within a, a larger scale model. So just to, to summarize how we go about constructing the JCN, what we're starting off with is this uh, set of simplicial cells which define the domain of the simulation where at each node within the uh, simulation we've got a combination of field values. Um, we look at cells individually to begin with. So here I've taken the small bit of the data set, I've broken it down into two triangular cells. What we've got here are the subdivision of the cells against the uh, two, two separate fields. The solid lines represent the division against uh, the second field. The dotted lines are the division against the first field. And uh, what we do, we start off by taking a cell, fragmenting it initially on the value of the first field. That gives us a, a set of, uh, a, a, a larger set of fragments. We then fragment those fragments against the value of the second field. We get a, a smaller set of fragments. And now we start merging regions. If we have adjacent regions which have the uh, similar set of properties, we merge them together into what we call slabs. And then the JCN is the dual graph of slabs defined by slab adjacency. And the, the, the important thing to note is that if we subdivide the problem and we start doing the subcomputation of the fragments on different nodes or different processing elements, when we come to define this, the JCN, we've now got to do communication um, across those nodes. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Fujian to go into the details of the implementation. So for our implementation, uh, we used Eden. Eden is a dialect of Haskell that is tailored for uh, distributed uh, memory architectures. Uh, in a distributed uh, system, we first need a way to create a pr uh, parallel or, uh, par process. Uh, Eden provides two primitive constructs for this process abstraction that uh, lifts a uh, function of uh, type A to B to a process AB and process instantiation operator that actually launch a process abstraction onto, as a child process and pro um, probably on a remote node creates all communication channels, send the inputs and retrieves the output when the results are ready. Uh, to implement uh, this uh, primitives, Eden uh, has actually extended the uh, GHC runtime system. And uh, also, Eden runtime system uh, provides uh, abstraction for process creation, task placement, data communication, and synchronization. So uh, programmers doesn't need to be, be that much worry about this lower level uh, concepts on the distributed computation. Uh, furthermore, so Eden provides a rich set of parallel skeletons. We are all familiar for higher order functions like a map and fold and how we can combine them to get more complicated behaviors. So we, have, we can do the same thing on a distributed setting. Eden has a power map, for example, has a power map a skeleton that uh, performs a map operation uh, on a uh, distributed architecture. And uh, by using power map, we can, uh, we can uh, generalize our uh, serial map reduce uh, function to a, a distributed one. Uh, 
uh, this, having this uh, rich set of uh, parallel skeletons that can actually accelerate the development. So that was one of the reasons that we chose Eden uh, for our implementation. Our general strategy for distributed implementation of the So as reported in the last uh, year, uh, our general strategy is to partition the domain, uh, computing the local uh, JCNs across the subdivision, and then employ a reduction strategy to uh, generate a global structure. Uh, for input and output, uh, because our input for, uh, data sets are provided into, uh, as a set of uh, input files, the parent process uh, gives the file name and indexes um, into the file that each child uh, requires to read data from, and then each child process uh, directly access to the, uh, to the input files. The result is written uh, to the output file by the main process. We have run our experiments on uh, HPC, uh, one of the HPC clusters at University of Leeds. Uh, each node in the cluster has 16 cores and 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, there is a Luster file system, and uh, data is uh, network uh, user data is transferred over infinity band network. Also, in our shared memory implementation, our divide and conquer skeleton uh, gives us the best performance. Uh, Eden also has several implementation of uh, divide and conquer uh, skeleton, and so it was a, a good starting point for distributed implementation. Here is, uh, on, so on the top, we can see the runtime profile of JCN computation uh, for CGEN database uh, data set on 16 and 32, uh, using 16 or 32 PEs. Each horizontal line shows the activity of uh, one uh, PE over time. So as can be seen, um, each uh, PE, uh, PE can take different time to compute the data, and the reason is that um, the, comp uh, the, the computation work depends on the, chain, uh, on the property of the data, so it depends on how, uh, how much the gradient is changing. And uh, for data, uh, for depending on the feature of the data set, it can be quite different in different subset of data. Uh, on the uh, lower part, you can see the, the computation of JCN for uh, synthetic data set, uh, which uh, has a uh, unified uh, change of gradient, and uh, there you can get, we can get a much more balanced computation. So in short, JCN, um, because JCN is a data-dependent computation, divide and conquer skeletons uh, leads to an unbalanced computation law. Uh, it was similar to one of these effects was seen in uh, one of the work presented in the morning. So the solution that is uh, usually used in um, high performance computation is over decomposition. So uh, dividing, dividing the sub problem into uh, so many sub problems that there, uh, there are actually processing elements. Uh, to do so, we need the a skeleton with dynamic load balancing. It then uh, provides uh, a set of work pool skeletons. So the basic work pool uh, has a simple interface like a parallel map but it actually uses, um, dynamically assigns tasks to the P, uh, processing elements as, as soon as uh, they have uh, done the previous jobs. Uh, but we also need um, our process uh, consist a manage phase. It then also extend the simple work pool skeleton to integrate both map and reduce functions. But um, for all these extensions, they assume that merger function um, can, in, uh, can merge the intermediate results in any arbitrary order. Uh, for JCN, if we merge um, two JCNs that are related to two sub-problems that are not especially adjacent, 
we get two disjoint graphs. So it's, it's like we have done a redundant computation that doesn't uh, give us any information. It's just wasting CPU cycles or uh, communication networks. So we need a new skeleton uh, that has uh, dynamic load balancing in both map and reduce. And, uh, and also we can apply a multi-level uh, reduction uh, of uh, intermediate results uh, considering their especially adjacency uh, relationship in the domain. So here's a simple, uh, simple example. It's a data set that uh, is divided to eight sub-problems. Uh, what we mean by multi-level reduction is that we first uh, merge uh, the ones that are especially adjacent in, for example, X direction. Um, this gives us uh, four sub-problems then we can uh, merge uh, those around uh, X direction again. And then finally we get two sub-problems that we are going to merge them around uh, Z, uh, along the Z direction. So we develop a new work skeleton uh, for uh, JCN or JCN-like computations. Uh, so given a da uh, simple data set, we have a split function that divides the uh, data set into a set of sub-problems and returns a range order, range, uh, reduction order. Reduction order just encodes the uh, geometry or relation between different sub-problems in the domain. So this can be later used to, def uh, to determine which of these intermediate results are, uh, neighbor, are, are adjacent. The uh, sub-problems are uh, sent to Eden Workpool Skeleton. Eden Workpool Skeleton creates a set of uh, workers and assigns tasks to them. Uh, later on, when the inter we have some intermediate results, uh, they should be merged together. Um, merge the task is like the function that I explained in the last. Uh, yes. So I'm getting a little confused by the, by the data flow. If there's a very large multi gigabyte data set in this application, is that distributed ahead of time to the worker nodes, or is that? So the split is actually, by when I split the uh, uh, data, I actually mean uh, working on the indexes of the file. So each P, each P directly accessed the input file and read the. The data layer is separate, so whatever the file system or data storage. It's a luster file system. It's a, okay, okay. So each, this is really metadata just about which indexes to access, and then the workers go directly to the luster file system. Yes. So uh, then the mm, major uh, merger task is looking into the output of Eden work pool. Uh, and when we recognize that uh, two, the results of two intermediate adjacent uh, sub-problems are ready, it, it, uh, puts, it asks the Eden work, Eden work pool skeleton to uh, launch uh, another task to merge these two sub-problems. Uh, so let's say here, worker, in, uh, worker N is assigned to uh, merge those two sub-problems. A dynamic channel is created between this child process to transfer uh, the inter intermediate data and then uh, worker and merge these two sub-problems. Uh, output of Eden work pool is a list of, uh, is, output is a list of uh, computed com uh, results. And the, fine, uh, the last element of this list is our global, uh, is our final global uh, JCN structure. Here is uh, the runtime profile of running uh, <laughs> computing JCN for Hurricane Isabel data sets. And as you can see that some of the PEs uh, uh, take much longer uh, to compute while the other ones are uh, doing lots of uh, smaller tasks. Uh, we run our, uh, so we did our experiments on two different data sets, CGEN data set and uh, three different resolution of Isabel data set. Um, the pink line shows divide and conquer performance and the blue line is our rock bullet skeleton performance. So in all cases, uh, we got better performance using our skeleton because it's, um, it utilizes all P's much better than divide and conquer. But divide and conquer also has an advantage of a low communication overhead. Because in divide and conquer, when we merge two uh, sub-problems, one, one of these sub-problems has already been computed locally. So we only send one JCN. While for uh, 
our new work, uh, our workforce skeleton uh, doesn't consider the locality of uh, sub-problems when assigning to merge them. We need uh, another uh, experiment, so compare the uh, full computation of JCN uh, with uh, uh, well, with the case that we don't perform the merger phase. So only uh, doing the uh, first stage of computing JCNs locally. And you can see, especially in the Isabel data set, a full resolution, that we got a much better perform, a much better speed up if we don't need to do a merger phase. It's almost like four times the speed up. This further motivates to have a distributed representation of JCN as is already uh, in uh, computational topology. People have been looking into finding distributed re representation of data, data structures. So our observation was that um, when merging JCNs, we only need to look at the boundary of uh, only the nodes of JCN that are related to the boundary of the data sets because the internal nodes are not going to be changed. It's just the nodes lying on the boundary that are going to merge or link to other node nodes. So that would give us the opportunity to reduce the communication uh, by just sending the, uh, the boundary of JCN. So we come up with a new strategy based on consisting of a distributed representation and incremental update. Uh, here's a simple example, two data sets. We compute JCN for each of them. Uh, the white part is the internal parts that doesn't need to be sent around. Uh, so for merging those, we just merge uh, the boundary of them. And uh, after um, uh, then using this merge boundary uh, JCNs, we can update the local uh, representation of our JCN. But there was another problem here was that so we could, we could get a good performance. The advantage of this approach is to uh, reduce communication by just sending the boundary. But when we do over decomposition, for many sub-problems, the internal part is very small. So we end up sending and almost everything. And this means that in, uh, when I'm, we are merging them, we need, uh, not on, we need to consider not only uh, adjacent uh, uh, adjacency of subdomains, but also uh, we should consider the uh, number of uh, internal and external nodes of JCNs, uh, which also needs more complicated skeletons. Okay. So to wrap up, where we've got to at the moment is we've now got a, a, an implementation of the algorithm which is more scalable. On the shared memory uh, machine, we could get up to data sets of maybe 100 by 100 by 100. With Isabel, we've got 25, maybe 30, 40 times that uh, running comfortably on, on a relatively small number of nodes on, on, the, on the cluster. Um, so we've got a basis for doing further scaling. Um, the result, I think, however, is we've learned some unexpected lessons. And then the, one of those is that skeletons themselves are, are great abstractions for doing parallelism on, in a distributed setting, but they're actually very non-trivial functions. They're, they're conveniently abstract, but they inconveniently hide a great deal of detail that's uh, important when you're looking at performance. So the question is, can we have our cake and eat it too? And, and I think the, 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 the question that we sort of ended up with at this point is, skeletons are probably too high level for what we want to do in high performance distributed computing. Are there some sensible building blocks, however, that mean that we can implement uh, reusable abstractions that take into account of memory, communication costs, and so on, from which you could then get high-level skeletons as special cases. Um, open question. Um, other issues that come up, well, tooling is still an issue. We're now uh, trying to understand performance across hundreds of cores. Existing uh, performance tools really aren't up to it, and, and there's some questions about how we manage with I.O. Um, where we're going in the future, well, at the moment, our work's moving more towards running on GPU clusters, and we're look, starting to worry more about heterogeneity of resources and, and the, the complexity of the memory hierarchy. Within uh, the, this, the computational science community at the moment, there's a lot of interest in now moving towards in situ processing, where instead of having this intermediate data set in between your simulation and your visualization, you stream the two together uh, effectively live. And that raises interesting questions about how we might exploit laziness. 
And, and one of our, my colleagues said, well, actually, you're not thinking big enough scale. Um, uh, you ought to try running this on Tiani 2. And you can look up Tiani 2 on the supercomputing top 500. Uh, since he's a, a joint appointment with NUDT in China, I hold out some hope that we might uh, actually get there. Okay, so a uh, quick thank you to people who made this possible, including the funders and all of our colleagues and collaborators. Um, just to wrap up, i uh, just point out that we, the JCM work itself is now morphing into something which is called fiber, uh, um, uh, uh, fibers, and um, hopefully next time, this time next year, we might be able to report something interesting about a different kind of representation. So the exciting thing is all of this is now running purely in Haskell, so no longer will we generate JCNs and then have to do the graphics bit in C. We're hoping to move the whole pipeline into Haskell. So on that happy note, I'll stop. Okay, the, um, the on disk representation is, is, a, is a fairly dumb representation, it's just basically blocks of flows. Um, the in memory representation, um, let me think, the, uh, we, we're using um, uh, we, the cells are, cons are constructors, they're, they're using unbox fields, so we're trying to be sensible about memory allocation and management. The, the, one of the big bottlenecks is the data structure that stores the boundary information. When we do merger, we have to look at matching uh, fragments across different cells, and we use a KD tree for that. So there was a nice talk this morning about you know, how, you, how you might uh, do parallel computing over, over KD trees. I mean, our KD tree is fairly dumb. Uh, we got um, the, the guys from UNSW were very helpful in giving us some help in, in improving the performance of that, but still a long way, long way to go. And, and probably that's a bottleneck that we'd have, we'd have to try and remove in the future. I think a fork of GHC 610. No, they, no, no, they, no, 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 uh, Phil Trinder just uh, had a PhD student complete, for example, who's done some nice work on, on combining uh, GHC SMP with uh, the distributed version, the uh, GHC GUM that uh, he and uh, Paul Ben Royal were here at Watt developed. So there's some interesting work on hybrid runtime systems here, which we haven't yet looked at ourselves. So, um, first of all, this is great work, and I'm, I like very much how a real-world application really pushes the boundaries of the skeletons and identifies issues such as the, the distributed out such an immediate thing that that just is not is not properly addressed so far. Uh, for a question, I would like to ask. So, boil, boiling down your computation scheme a little bit, it's basically the trade-off between a grid of in unbalanced 
tasks. If you geometrically uh, divide, divide the problem and have only communication and boundaries, and a work pool, which is well balanced because you over you over distribute, but then you have the overhead of merging, which we have seen very well in the in the graph. Is there a general theme? Do you imagine this skeleton work to be useful as a skeleton in general beyond, beyond your contour net? Well, I think I mean, the answer to that I think is yes. Again, one of the points about the, this algorithm is it is. If it were just implementing the JCM, that we wouldn't be learning very much. But if you look at many of the algorithms in, in, in visualization, for example, they often have the, this kind of property. So they have a topological algorithms, for example, uh, things like tracking, uh, uh, doing, doing particle tracking, uh, have similar kinds of problems in that in the uh, structure, the decomposition of the work across uh, different subdomains. Um, coming back to the skeleton, I, I think. You know, one of the interesting things to, is to compare where we are with using functional approaches and skeletons as abstractions to where people do work in area, in, for example, in the imperative runtime system world are. So I mentioned the work on the Charm++ platform that underpins NAMD. And, and you know, they've got some interesting approaches to how do you specialize some quite general uh, support for uh, distributed parallelism with the information that you know about specific application domains. So plug-in schedulers, for example, where you, you ad adapt schedule based on what you know about the data or the computation that you're trying to do. So that, you know, I think that comes back to the question about you know, how, do we, how do we parameterize skeletons themselves in a way that we can make that adaptation easier and, and less painful than having to, if what's effectively write a, a brand new, highly specialized skeleton, which is a, almost an oxymoron. Yeah. 